Welcome, welcome everyone to our event on HLS on Broadway. We have here a very exciting panel um, of very distinguished, very accomplished producers of the Broadway stage. Um, I am the host for this panel, and Roy Furman is the moderator for this panel, and I will start by introducing Roy Furman, and then Roy will introduce the rest of the panel, and then we will go to um, remarks um, that each of the panelists may want to start us off with, and we'll do some Q&A and discussion. I will also ask some questions, and so it'll be a little bit freewheeling after a while. So Roy Furman, to my left, is the class of 1963 from Harvard Law School. He is one of the country's top producers for the Broadway stage. He is the real deal. Um, he is an investment banker. That is his day job. Um, but in the meantime, he has won 13 Tony Awards, including for shows such as Book of Mormon, which is still running. Last year alone, he won two Tony Awards, one for Hello, Dolly, and Dear Evan Hansen. They are both still on, on Broadway if you want to see them. He also... Selling tickets right after. <laughs> <laughs> Cats is another one. Cats is another one of his shows still running. Um, I, we have, I'm very, very excited that he is here with us. Um, he is our moderator for this panel, and I will turn things over to him for, for, for the moment, and then he will introduce you to the rest of the panel, and then we will do a discussion. Thank you. I'm sitting next to a, a professor of law who is <clears throat> also a great pianist, and is, is performing as well as moderating, so that's that's really juggling some stuff. By the way, if this was a boat, we'd be totally tipped over. Um, we need people to come in through the side door. Um, anyway, I'm pleased. I'll introduce you. Dale uh, over here, Sendali, is um, the only practicing lawyer on the panel uh, who practices in this business. Um, but uh, she's with Kirkland and & Ellis and a major figure in the legal side of the theater business. Um, and uh, we should just go on and introduce everyone, right, I think. Um, and then we have Nell Benjamin to my left um, and uh, Lawrence O'Keefe, um, who are husband and wife. And um, <laughs> happily, Dangerous uh, happily sharing husband and wife. <laughs> and um, uh, I worked with them many years ago when we did Legally Blonde, which they wrote uh, for Broadway. Um, a terrific show. It was a great show. And uh, one of the shows that didn't last as long as it should have, uh, we'll get to that maybe later, but the economics didn't work. The show was too expensive for the number of people who came. It had very big audiences, but once those big audiences begin to decline a bit, if the cost structure underlying the show is too high and too high for the project, which it was, bad producing, um, uh, but it would still be running now, in my opinion, if that was that good a show. And uh, now is now writing uh, Mean Girls, uh, Tina Fey's show, uh, which is coming next season, which I'll be involved with in a passive way, but nicely involved. And you're doing Heathers. Um, and um, uh, anyway, very talented people and lovely people and lovely people here. And over to you, Jeannie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so why don't we start with um, why don't we start with uh, you, Dale? Um, would you like to say a few words of uh, further introduction, further remarks to set things up a bit? Okay, I'd be happy to do that. I'm also lucky enough to be a uh, lecturer here for the past eight years, teaching copyright and trademark litigation. And one of the great things about Broadway is that there are a lot of legal issues tied up with the creative aspects of the show. Um, I had litigated the Spider-Man musical case where a lot of that involves, does a director really have anything separate that they copyright? Or is it really owned by the people who actually wrote the show? So those are cool issues. And I'm litigating now the Anastasia musical case by someone who said it's based on a French play that they had written. And that gets to issues of, well, gee, if some both people are drawing from the same source, 
which is the fact that there were real life people who thought that they or pretended to be Anastasia and claimed to be Anastasia. Can everybody have that similarity in a show? So there's a lot of legal issues that are a lot of fun. But for me, having been a member of the law school drama society here uh, and a former president of the Yale Dramat, what I like is that I have been able to combine my interests. Roy is a real lead producer, and he'll talk about the different kinds of producers. I have produced with a P, listed in the program, uh, it should have been you, but I'm much more of an investor. I get to passively give money to a lot of different shows that gets you to be involved in some way. And I'm also a um, Tony voter because I'm on the board of the American Theater Wing, and I do a lot of pro bono work um, uh, for them, um, stemming out of uh, a history thesis I did when I was at Yale on the history of the stage door canteen. So what I'm trying to say is if you're interested in theater and you have friends who are interested in theater, there's lots of different ways of getting involved, even if you're not ready to be a lead producer of a show. And if you have people who are interested in legal issues, they're still being sorted out, and that there's ways of getting involved in that, too. Roy, I'd like, um, before I turn things over to you for, for a bit, I, I wanted to also acknowledge that we have with us Larry Lessig, who is the Roy Furman Professor of Law. <laughs> so Dale started us talking about the different kinds of producing. What Can you tell us about that? Um, and we also, in addition, maybe before, even before, we'd love to hear about how you got to this um, career of being a producer after having been um, at Harvard Law School and then an investment banker. How, how did this come about? I'll take the last one first. Um, good to see you, Larry. Um, uh, and David Zippel is here also. We should honor a great, uh, a Tony-winning great talent and, uh, and friend of the law school and graduate of the law school. Um, I got involved in it because I've always loved theater. And um, I practiced for a few years, then went into Wall Street, and uh, was, uh, was invited to, give, to put money into a show, what Dale was talking about, just being a, what was called then an angel. And I started contributing to certain shows that I liked with not even a care or a thought. I had my opening night tickets, and I went, and that was it. Um, and gradually, incrementally, I ended up getting more involved and began to realize that I could actually have a voice. I could understand the balance sheet and financial side, and then got to learn that I actually could make a contribution on the creative side, moderately, but I could, and the combination led me to end up sort of asking for a seat at the table and then getting more and more involved until it's now reached a stage where I'm actively producing, even as I continue to work on Wall Street. Um, the, the comment I'd make regarding producing is it's... Uh, it's a terrible term misused by everybody. Um, most people don't produce. They write a check and come to opening nights and call themselves producers. And the only admonition I give is if, if people approach you as the producer of X, Y, and Z, try to find out what they really did on X, Y, and Z. The odds are almost 95% that they've done almost nothing except say that they're the producer of X, Y, and Z. Um, but I, I codify it into three categories of producing. Um, the first is, um, is lead producer. And the lead producer is the CEO of the company. Um, and it is a big business. And the legal considerations, which Dale is reveling in, um, it's a great... We are it's a, Harvard Law School. No, no. It's a great business to be in because the, the, the legal involvements are endless. They are daily in every phase, whether it's union contracts, le uh, uh, employee contracts, creative people contracts, lawsuits coming left and right. The more successful you are, the more you attract in lawsuits. But in any event, um, the, the, I'll just give you one idea of the sense of scale of this business. And as my wife pointed out, it's an aberration, but worth mentioning. Hamilton has three companies going now, one in New York, one in Chicago, a sit-down in Chicago, and a sit-down on the West Coast. It's grossing $10 million a week 
unheard of for theater, but $10 million per week. It's a half billion dollar a year enterprise. And there'll soon be one in London in the fall and another one in the West Coast National Touring Company that will be going out in February of next year. So this is, again, an aberrational show. But to give you a sense, there aren't that many startups that become half billion dollar companies. Um, the lead producer is involved in every decision made from conception through realization and then beyond. Um, it's a very challenging role. Very few do it, very few do it well. Um, the next level are the producers who are actively involved in the production even when they're not a lead producer. That is, producers who are looked to by the lead producer for assistance in the myriad number of things, choosing a theater, gaining access to a theater, sponsorship, getting somebody on the cast, making casting decisions, etc. That's the second. The third are the passive ones that Dale was referring to, the people who are involved and their producers by name because they give or get a certain amount of money that puts them on the marquee. Now, I've played each of those roles, um, and, um, and there's a very big difference. So that's, that's that. Great. <clears throat> How does one go from being... Um, a producer who gives or gets money to actually becoming a real uh, creative force in a production. Me? Um, how you get there is two, one of two ways. You can either be invited into the pantheon of people who lead produce by other lead producers who invite you to join them, which is how it happened to me. I don't have the time to create something de novo, um, but the creation of something is extraordinary um, and usually takes five to six, I would say five to six years. If you're lucky. If you're lucky, yeah. <laughs> Seven to eight years. Um, we'll adjust on the fly. Um, but, um, but those I... I, I you know, really give my, my, my greatest uh, hand to the people who create them from start. Um, very, very challenging. Um, um, I'm thinking of uh, Book of Mormon, which I am involved with, fortunately, um, but that one took seven years. And that was with the guys from South Park who really was smart and knew what they were doing and always wanted to write a musical, seven years. American in Paris, with music already written by the Gershwins, took five years. Um, it's a real challenge to create them. And if you're creating new music, new lyrics, these, you'll talk about your shows. Um, but, um, but that's one that is very challenging. It's easier to come in, frankly, as I've done, two years into the process, or three years in to be invited in to be a lead producer with the person who was the original lead producer, and then move on from there. That's what I tend to do when I lead produce. Yeah. Well, no, just to add to that, but there are there will be people like us begging you to come in that third way because we will have projects that don't have uh, you know a movie to be based on or or backing they're just original ideas and um, and sometimes some of the more exalted producers you know don't need to or don't want to take the risk at that stage so we are often looking for someone who wants who has done stuff before has some knowledge of it and would like to sort of shepherd a project uh, through. And again, that, that becomes complicated because sometimes you do get people who, as Roy said, say, oh, well, I produced X when they wrote a check. And, you know, you sort of go back and forth with that. But there are, there are, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people looking for folks who want to be involved creatively and, and want to um, shepherd something crazy. So that's very exciting for us when someone wants to come in that way. So now, Larry, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, some of your projects and some of the, the creative challenges and how that interacts with the producing challenges. Oh, sure. Hi. Um, well, uh, you may know some of the, the projects that we have worked on. Obviously, Legally Blonde, it's based, on, it's based in a law school. You may have heard of it. Um, but Heather's 
a very dark, black, almost nihilistic comedy that was sort of like a, a dark antidote to the lies of the Reagan years and Mean Girls, which is actually uh, almost related by blood, uh, also about cruelty and misbehavior and injustice in a high school. We do tend to uh, get attracted to projects that deal with ethics rather explicitly or deal with morals explicitly. And that seems to be sort of the meat and potatoes of musicals in general. Other art forms don't seem to be as prescriptive or preachy. But if you go to a musical and you don't actually have some new bit of moral instruction by the time you leave, you feel like you've missed out on an opportunity. Um, so uh, we are attracted to those things and it can often make for button pushing or shows that don't necessarily match the narrow window of what uh, Broadway loves, but we keep trying. And uh, Mean Girls is gonna be the frickin' best thing ever. You're gonna love it. Um, but the producing uh, element is in, inextricably tied to that because uh, a show that is unthreatening and very optimistic and full of all the values that Broadway expects is an easier sell from the very beginning. Meanwhile, we do Heathers, which has kids in the meanest high school in the world, uh, in which uh, the, the, the short version, for those of you who don't know it is, it is about the meanest high school, it's in Ohio, and it is so cruel, and it's run by three girls named Heather, Heather, and Heather, and uh, two misfit kids, played by Winona Ryder and Christian Slater, accidentally kill the head Heather, and the uh, girl, played by Winona Ryder, says, this is terrible, we should turn ourselves in, and the boy, played by Christian Slater, is a psychopath, and says, this is great, let's kill all the other assholes. So Broadway, uh, so from the very beginning, the originating team was three producers with that title and two authors, Kevin Murphy and myself, and a director, Andy Fickman, and all six of us had the title producer. And we said, we have the power to do this. We're going to launch it. We're going to fund it from the very beginning, and then we will sell it. We will give away the power to some rich visionary, brave producer in New York City who will take it to Broadway. And we got to opening night off-Broadway and no one had done that. No producer on Broadway had taken a, a swing at it because it contained certain things I think that uh, were a little too scary for Broadway. Broadway sometimes has murder, sometimes has sex and swearing, but it didn't necessarily have teenagers doing all these things. So um, we wound up being among the lead producers to the very end. We didn't want to. We got Scott Prizend, a lovely guy who did uh, We Will Rock You on Broadway, a good guy, and he helped bring it to Off-Broadway. It <clears> did <throat> fairly well Off-Broadway. Now, hopefully, we're going to London next year. These shows take a long time. We took seven years of believing it ourselves, funding it ourselves, um, and the journey still continues. I think we'll make it to Broadway with the feedback we've learned. We may make further emendations, changes to the text based on what we've learned by beta testing it in front of various audiences. And we will hopefully uh, have a version that enough people believe in and as our cult has grown uh, and you, YouTube has spread the bootlegs far and wide, eventually popular demand will hopefully move the Overton window of what Broadway accepts so that it, Heathers will be dead center. And if we're wrong, we're wrong and we're doing great already. But. Yeah, there's so much more I, I could babble about, about how producing is part of the calculation from the very beginning. Any author who doesn't realize that is certainly missing out. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Um, I'd add to that that quite a few years ago, a female producer named Stacy Mindich, uh, who's a wonderful woman who I had worked with on some shows, came to me and said, she's gonna do a show on Broadway um, about an autistic uh, person, a young high school kid who was autistic or on the autism scale, and he can barely communicate, and um, he gets caught up in a situation where the other sort of loser in the school kills himself, and that happens early in the musical, and in the, in the show, and it's a musical. Um, <laughs> and um, And the only reason I got involved with that pitch, that powerhouse pitch, was because the people behind it were brilliant, Pasek and Paul, two young, very talented writers. Um, and, um, but the odds on that succeeding were one in 50, commercially in my opinion, but it made sense to support young talent, and it was worth the shot. The theme was 
crazy, is crazier than Heather's, um, and that's Dear Evan Hansen, for those of you who know it. And now the, you can't steal a ticket, and it's, it's such an outrageous commercial success, and we did not know that at all. Um, really, we knew it would be artistically beautiful, but we thought it would appeal to a very small group. But you don't know anymore. You think you know, and those happy, sunny, optimistic shows that can get money easily often turn out to be the ones that go right down the drain, while the Dear Evan Hansons of the world attract a global audience of young people and their parents. Parents are taking yeah. their children to see it um, so they can communicate. A lot of parents have told me they had better conversations with their children after seeing that show than they had had for decades. Um, that somehow that show opened up to be that gap between parent and child, because this is all about, that show is about the mothers, mm -hmm. fathers, and the children get caught up in this. So go no. It's uh, sometimes the most the far-fetched ideas. So Heather's, oh, no, we he welcome you to Broadway. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Heather's too, like Evan Hansen, like it is kids driving these ticket sales. I think Heather's cast album is number five on the cast album charts, and it's the one that didn't ever have a Broadway production. So people like are, are loving the dark side where we like to be because that's what you see and and bringing inspiration as Evan Hansen does as Heather's does out of that uh, if you can do that on Broadway then then you're winning I I, I, I not only have a producer sort of uh, experience in this it's it's uh, I'm how shall I say it um, my main concern as a writer was not the producing. There were other people there to do the job and to make and to build the house that we could fill with our story. But before either of those, artistic concerns or structural or business matters, there is the ethical or, or the, the moral question. And I, I kind of want to push that even harder because if you're asked to invest in a show, you might as well ask, what is it recommending? What is it advocating? Not what does it say, because that's vague. Not what is the theme of it, because that's even vaguer. But what is it recommending or advocating? And if you can get a coherent argument out of the person asking for your money, that's a very good sign. The, what Evan, In general, yeah. you can get a coherent argument out of the person asking <laughs> <True>. for money. <laughs> very that's true. Good but what Evan Hansen <laughs> is recommending and advocating is very clear, too. It is recommending and advocating greater communication and forgiveness between parents and kids. That's one of the most remarkable things. And so, in other words, Broadway is very much like any other business. It's looking for a better mousetrap. It is looking for something that has not been said before. Stephen Sondheim once said that audiences are trained and conditioned to pay money for a truth they already know or a lie they'd like to believe. You know, love conquers all. Mm, doesn't always. Racism is bad. Yes, we knew that as early as 1949 with South Pacific. It, that was revolutionary then, but, but Broadway has known <laughs> for a long time. So if you can deliver something new that, that we have not thought of to say out loud in, the, in exactly that way, like Evan Hansen does, or Mean Girls does, or if you can remind audiences of some moral truth or some ethical thing that they've forgotten, you are well on your way to building a better mousetrap, if that makes sense. And from all that will spring the loyalty that will keep you with the quirky weird show for seven, eight, 10, 13 years. Um, so that's, that's the horse I would bet on. Well, this is really fascinating um, that you're talking about Broadway musicals in terms of advocacy and normative recommendations. That's just a framework that um, I certainly hadn't really thought about at, when I'm watching a Broadway show, but um, it's, it's actually a very convincing argument. It makes for better songs, too. <laughs> so much. Yeah, um, especially in a school where um, much of what the students are learning is how to make arguments and how to make them sound coherent and how to um, advocate for things um, that they um, think should happen um, as, as an attorney um, or in other, in other venues um, in public life. And what's so... I, I wanted to come back to this idea of morals and ethics and how that is really central to your vision of what makes a successful show, not just artistically successful, but also commercially successful, um, because that's just really interesting. What are the moral and ethical expectations of an audience? Are they always changing? 
Um, is it something that you think that uh, you said a better mousetrap? Is it a better mousetrap to fit the expectations of that particular generation? Um, is it uh, something that's universal that that it coheres through time, and it's just a matter of finding a better way to capture what it is audiences are hungry for um, always? So it's uh, what are the moral and ethical? I, I suppose the part of what producers are doing or trying to, and writers are trying to capture what it is that the moral and ethical questions that really preoccupy the generation or that are in the unconscious of a generation that they don't, they don't even know yet. They don't even know that is the question that they're really going to want to ponder. And it's, it's part of your job as people who are creating these works for the stage to argue that this is what people are going to want to be thinking about and then also to, to make the case once the, the show is up. Um, so I just wanted to ask about um, how do you arrive upon, is it a, a, a prediction exercise? Is it a looking back at the past of what's been successful? Oh, no. um, in a, to talk in a song framework for lyrics, we started before we could, uh, you know, before anyone took a risk on us with Legally Blonde, we started writing children's musicals. Uh, and well, actually, no. First, we did uh, the mice, which was uh, part of a musical called Three, um, which we got through a friend. And then we were called by TheatreWorks USA, which is a big, uh, which is a company that sends children's musicals throughout the country, and they to, to, to some schools. Families, that's the only theater they'll get all year. Right. So they go to like the school auditorium, and a tour bus rolls up with four actors who build their own set, put on a show, put it back in the van, and take it to the next school, um, and. Uh, the the chairman, uh, the artistic director, called us and said, "Do you want to do a children's show?" And I said, "He just did Bat Boy, uh, which is about you know suicide and bestiality." And we did a we did a show about an adulterist exterminator and a suicide pact. Do you know our work? Is this you know how should we, how, how how are we going to write a kids show? And uh, Barbara said, "You write a show and let me worry about the kids." <laughs> and I, we said, okay. So we, we wrote a show called Sarah Plain and Tall, based on the book Sarah Plain and Tall. Um, and uh, the reason I mention it is because we would watch the kids watch our show. We would sit up in the balcony and sort of watch the children. And kids are not a, as well socialized as adults. So adults will watch your show. And if a song's not working, they will sit very quietly. And then they'll tell you afterwards how great your show is. And then they'll go have a drink and rip it apart with someone else. Uh, sometimes on your opening night, they will drink your champagne and tell, and tell each other how bad your show is. But kids, uh, if a song or a moment isn't working, they will start hitting each other. And they will be very physical about their boredom and displeasure. So it it's like a waving field it's of wheat. Amazing! Like you can just watch them, and and it was a great lesson in oh that lovely ballad that restates the feelings of the lead character that we already know because we've been here for the last twenty minutes is not working. It's not. It's lovely, but it's not holding them. And what we found over and over again is that if there was a moral question in the song for one of the characters, a question of something they were going to do that could go really well or really badly, the kids were riveted, no matter what it was. A conflict, an argument, a dilemma, a crossroads. A situation are... where, you know, I could do this, but it might be very dangerous, or, you know, and, and over and over again, those moral dilemmas make for really good songs, particularly if you've got a solo song. Rather than have a person just stand up and sing, I'm feeling a feeling, you know, it's like, oh, great. We all feel feelings. Backing up even farther macro, to be fair, all of this stuff that we admire, you don't need it in your show if you have Hugh Jackman. No. <laughs> if you have Anna Kendrick, you can just write, you know, phone book, the musical, and you'll be fine. In other words, Broadway is no more exempt from the rules of Aristotle's rhetoric than any, any other art form or any other behavior. I, I, am, I read Aristotle's rhetoric way too late, but it has, I'm obsessed with it now. And, and as, just as a recap, it's actually the very best guide for a writer. Um, the poetics are great, but if you're going to write or perform, it's wonderful to have that because, of course, ethos is the very first thing that an audience sees. Your virtues, your background. Your star, your Hugh Jackman, or your poster, or the narrative about your show. Wow, this is Spring Awakening. It's based on the Franz Vatican expressionist novel about 
teen suicide and sexual repression in Germany. Wow, I wonder what they're going to do. Whoa, it's Duncan Sheik, the rock star, the folk pop dude. I wonder what he's going to do with Spring Awakening. That's the ethos. Before the show even begins, it's part of the narrative. So you go, you go there and you start with the ethos. Then you get the pathos, the emotions. And only after you've dwelled on that and wallowed in that for a while do you even listen to the words. Sadly, sorry for lyricists, but but the logos comes third. The logo comes third. Yeah. So, um, but look how, uh, if you've seen Hamilton or if you're familiar with the soundtrack, it works beautifully in Hamilton. There's this whole opening number about this this amazing this kid who wrote this am- amazing stuff, and we're waiting for him. And just you wait, and where is he? And there he is, and it's Lin Manuel. He is also the amazing kid who wrote this thing, and. Uh, and likewise, there's a fabulous lyric where they're like, here comes the general, the moment you've been waiting for. We didn't know we were waiting until they told us. We were, we're waiting. Where's George Washington? You know, so, it's and, genius. So in other words, Broadway is, is very, very explicitly and very blatantly using the, the uh, exercise of rhetoric in order to get enthusiasm, to get people into a room. And then we ask ourselves these basic societal questions. Almost all musicals I can think of that I enjoy are blatantly asking, are we okay? Are we, as a culture, okay? And if the answer is, no fucking way, we're doomed, then it's probably a Sondheim show. And that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. There's because a place for that. Because he has an ethos, yeah. Exactly. yeah there's, there's a place for that. And if, and, but a lot of Sondheim shows are, are become classics after they've had runs that do not make a ton of money. So the, I, I do talk about an Overton window for Broadway, and that's not the same as an Overton window for theater in general. You can do a great show that's uh, a lot of button pushing and will not go to Broadway, but will do fine. Uh, what was the question? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would just I, I would take some issue, um, although not with the latter part. But in fact, Broadway itself, using the generic term of Broadway, Broadway is now two thirds tourists, and um, it's, a, it's a different kind of thing. There's theater, our title is theater and Broadway. They're, they're somewhat different. And clearly, this issue of uh, ethics, morality, principle, a driving force is the playwright's responsibility in the play, usually. Musicals are a different animal because they cost much more money to put on. They need a much bigger audience in bigger theaters. And you have to have some selling points, as you mentioned, but also... <laughs> Um, great artistry, genius, and brilliance help. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and if, if you look at Lion King, I still don't know what it's about, other than <laughs> other than the circle of life. But it is one hell of a of a of an evening in theater. It's magnificently done. It's beautifully staged, um, and it will run for our lifetime and your lifetimes. Um, but I don't think it has much of a point of view other than it's just gorgeous and it's brilliant. Well, wait, but it's Hamlet with a happy ending, right? It's, <laughs> that's, it's, you know, well, if you're going to go somewhere, go to Hamlet and then give it a happy ending. Done. Boom. And also, by the way, by showing up, we are at, at Lion King, we're asking questions about monarchy, about the natural world. Uh, are we going to be okay? And the answer to Lion King is yes, if we do certain things, if we accept certain things, if we, if we change certain things. And a show with the name Disney on it is not necessarily going that to... It has some ethos. Yeah, it has yeah. an ethos, certainly, but it's also not necessarily going to push our buttons and, and <coughs> criticize our society as deeply as a show by Sondheim will. And I do love Broadway, and I, I love that there is room for both, that both a Sondheim show that is despairing and a Disney show can both be valid and get respect on Broadway. I, I, yeah, yeah I, 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 would, I would just add to all that. It does dismay some of us that shows that try, that aspire, that a wonderful works can't make it. And down at the Majestic Theater on 45th Street, <laughs> there is Phantom of the Opera. And every day they pour in. These people come to New York and they pour in to see, now in its 29th year, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like Mousetrap in London. I mean, they come because it's there. And it's stunning of a kind, I guess. And whatever, I, I'm nothing against Andrew Lloyd Webber or Phantom, but, but while you are aspiring to greatness and work, there are many, many people who come to see theater who come to see the shows they know. We've learned, interestingly, when Chicago 
made the movie, there was great consternation about whether it could work. Would the show keep running once there was a movie out uh, with big stars in it? Would they go to see the Broadway show? And it turned out, of course, that it gave the show 10 more years of life, if not more. And that repetition matters. You see it with your own children. They'll see something they like 10 times. Um, people take comfort. These tourists, bless them, but they get off the boats, they get off the buses, they get off the trains, and they come to see the same darn shows every season. And Phantom is doing a million dollars a week, while other shows that have done all that you've talked about can't make a dime. Um, so a lot of it is marketing, a lot of it is repetition, a lot of it is success, early success, a lot of it is simply having the right, the right combination of, of elements that make people want to go to see it. David had a question. Yeah, Roy, you had talked a little bit about um, Legally Blonde and the structure, financial structure of it, and Phantom and uh, Chicago are kind of the complete opposite in the sense, in the sense that Chicago was uh, the most minimal production you could imagine on Broadway, so the cost to run it are as low as you can get for a big musical. Of course, it's a very good big musical. And Phantom is not a I don't think of that great of musical. There's some pretty melodies in it, but it's the, the, the cost structure must be incredibly expensive to run that show because most of what it's about is about the physical beauty of it, and of course Hal Prince's seamless, beautiful direction, which is rather dazzling. But how do you figure out? I mean, I, I think I've been in the same uh, position that uh, uh, Larry and Nell have been in, where um, shows that. Well, the cost structure of a show has either prevented it from happening or shortened the run considerably. So it's a really, it's the producer and that side of the show where you really have to have somebody who knows what they're doing, the general management. But if you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible uh, balancing act. Um, Chicago is the easy one. They took a, a show that appeared at the Encores in City Center and didn't change literally a drop of it, took it as it was, minimal costumes, minimal sets, it's very inexpensive. Um, brilliant ad campaign by Spotgo, that black and white with the ladies and the legs, um, and it can run for a long time. Um, it, most shows are expensive. Legally Blonde is one. Uh, I'll give you so many that closed earlier than they should have. American in Paris, which I was direct lead producer of. Also the same phenomenon. Too many dancers, too many. It's a gorgeous show, too expensive. Uh, Billy Elliot, a great success. Too big a show, too many kids. Those Don kids were running around the stage all the time. And, and you have to pay them, and you have to pay them, and two others, because you need, you need yeah. replacements in the cast. Um, very expensive. Um, Motown, same reason, closed. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge. It's, it's not easy to do. Um, and, uh, uh, but hopefully... The longer the show runs, the less expensive it gets because the cast gets cheaper and, frankly, the sets diminish. Phantom was going to close a few years ago. They were ready to close it because it wasn't doing enough. And then they managed to you know, bring back another wind and it got five more years and probably a lifetime. Um, but uh, that one is probably much cheaper than when they started comparatively. And then there's one other thing which I was going to get to later, but I will get to it now, which is the revolution in, in theater, uh, which is premium pricing and dynamic pricing. That has changed the whole equation. And if you don't, I'll jump to yes, it because I'm raising yes. it to, hey, I'll go to it. Um, <laughs> but that is the whole difference in the world. It's the difference in raising money. It's, it's, everything is now different from what it used to be. The business used to, when Phantom started, and even as recently as when producers came, a show had a fixed price structure. When you went to the window, the tickets were $90 in the orchestra and 50 in the balcony and, or at mezzanine and 30 in the balcony. Then, whatever the number was, that was it. If the show was in demand, all of that excess money that people would be willing to pay to buy a seat for a show went to the scalpers or the brokers. And the theater, which put up all, took all the risk, got nothing out of it. It was woefully unbalanced. A speculator or scalper could buy a 90, let's take $100 round number, could buy a $100 ticket 
and sell it to anybody from all over the world who wanted to see the show for $500, make five times the money with literally no risk at all. While the show, which was <clears throat> five or seven years in, in, in delivery, could charge $100, and it would cost $85 a week to run effectively on that ticket and make 15% margin, um, and the scalpel was making 500 time, five times. Um, that has changed now irrevocably. And now you charge whatever the market will bear. And while the scalpers and speculators still make some money, it's the theater, the show that gets the money. And that is why Hamilton can be doing $10 million a week, because in the old days they would have been doing on their, on their original price structure about three and a half or four million dollars a week, uh, four and a half million a week. Um, that five extra million dollars a week is coming right into the theater. So that now is the major change in what's going on. It means you can now approach investors with a very different prospect for what happens if you succeed. All they have to do now is buy into the fact that you may have a success in Mean Girls or Heathers or whatever the show is, and they can see much more of a return uh, against the risk that they used to face. Um, so that has changed everything dramatically. Um, and enable shows that have big prices, big underlying costs to be able to get produced today. But there's also a lot of concern that you know not everybody can afford eight hundred dollars a, a ticket kinds of things. So there's a concern that while this is great for these shows long term, what is it going to mean for the theater audience and for a lot of the people who want to go, who are and who want to be involved, who are still at the busing tables part of their career, that kind of thing. So it seems like at the same time that's going on, there's a lot of effort to either with um, uh, auctions or, or you know, uh, lotteries, lotteries or uh, you know, the other kinds of you know, theater development fund kinds of things to try to get rush tickets or cheaper tickets to certain people or, and the like. But there is a concern that the audience is going to lose it. But I, I guess I had a question for are creators in the sense that Broadway, maybe I'm thinking of this as much as, a, as an IP lawyer, is, is so much a collaborative art form, right? I mean, you could create your own show and be in it, but, but most people yeah. in the theater are working with lots of other people, and you choose who you work with, and you choose the property, and you work with producers and the like. Um, and then there's the hope that the show runs, but how much are you thinking about, gosh, if I cut this number, people would maybe like the show better. You're not going to have people rustling in the seats. But artistically, I really want this number to, 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 to be in. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a feel from people who are in the weeds with really great shows, how much you're thinking of, of the commercial aspect of how to make the show run longer as you're writing it. Well, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm just going to say I'm always thinking of the audience because I am the audience for my own shows. So it, I don't think of it as like, oh, this would be commercially more sex successful because they'll be tap dancing and everybody loves tap dancing. Uh, I think, would I want to watch this at this moment right now? And There's and a very famous, uh, again, another Sondheim quote, which is that when you're writing a song, the wrong way to look at it is, wouldn't it be great if... That's what leads to vaudeville. That's what leads to gimmicks. That's what leads to turns. Oh, wouldn't it be great if there were roller skating in this number? That's, that's the, the trappings and the bells and whistles. Instead, you should be thinking, won't it be right if? Won't this be the logical yet surprising moment that that character has? Won't that be the, lo the logical yet surprising action that that character takes? <laughs> and you can get pyrotechnics just as pretty, just as wonderful bells and whistles if you go about it that way. In other words, if you are true to the story you're trying to tell, and if the story is surprising yet inevitable, um, then you're going to be, going to be doing okay. Um, but you're very funny. You, you brought up something very funny. There is a song in Heather's which was the moment where people would walk out. It was called Blue. And the first lyric was it's sung by two horny football players drunk at you know, one in the morning where they are both sort of leering at Veronica the lead. And the, it's like this fun Motown sort of let's get it on Marvin Gaye sort of thing. And the first line is, you make my balls so blue. 
all the kids love that number. They just laugh their heads off. And anyone over the age of like 30 would be like, oh, that's not what I want to be hearing right now. In other words, we were trying to be true to what teenagers do and how they talk. But it was not the right execution. It did not serve the story right. It did not actually keep the story moving because these two guys are entitled football assholes and they are capable of violence. And so we wanted to see what will Veronica do to keep herself safe. And instead we gave them sort of a vaudeville turn of a cute guys doing a bunch of jokes. It was a one joke song. And the audience proved that. We thought, oh, won't it be great if we, we refused to admit that we were thinking vaudeville and instead the audience reminded us of that. So for the London production, uh, we are hopefully using a great new song which we actually wrote for the high school edition. We have adapted the show for the high school edition. Samuel French came to us and said, we're getting too many high schools. You need to, to come up with a version with no swears. And, and so we had to rewrite it anyway. So in other words, the, the interaction with the audience is a, in, it's to me and to us, it is an integral part of it. The audience is part of the creative team in a way. They're not the paper you're writing the show on. You're, it's not the, a passive recipient. It is an active collaborator in an event that hopefully um, <clears throat> profits everybody on so many levels. Actually, there, you're... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, the, I do think, though, that collaboration with your director and your producers is also both essential and fraught for that same reason. Um, because I never think, oh, what's the audience going to like or you know, what's commercial? But I am often told or thinking, what can we do at this moment? Um, and if you have a great director, they'll say, we can do it. You know, whatever it is, we can do it. Um, or does this make sense? I'm working on something now where we have three big songs and I was the first one to raise the question of these three songs, and I wrote the lyrics for these three songs, that they are three different groups, three different mob scenes. So like, as an example, like one is a group of older people, one is a group of teenagers, and one is a group of, uh, of cabinet members. So that's three very distinct crowds that your ensemble has to play. And the question is, are we going to cast a whole bunch of people who can play all these things? Can we take our five ensemble members and make them all these different people? Is there a director who can do this creatively? Uh, and if not, shouldn't we rethink this? Um, it's, it's, if you get good people, if you trust your director and if you trust your producers, you won't think, oh, they're being, you know, they're being cheap about my song. You'll think, oh, okay, how do we work together to come up with the most creative and interesting version? Because sometimes those restrictions make for a better song. Like if I could write songs for a cast of thousands, that's great. But it might be a very sloppy show in addition to being uh, an expensive show. There's a, there's a video that Larry plays all the time about Chuck Jones. Does everyone know the, the Looney Tunes uh, animator producer Chuck Jones? Um, and I, re I recommend you look it up. It's called Every Frame of Painting Chuck Jones. And... Uh, he basically defined animation and comedy, and he did it with disciplines. He said there's rules. He would set rules for himself, like Bugs Bunny will never start a fight, or Daffy Duck will never back down from a, um, you know, a slight to his honor, to his ego. And if you, if, if you never break that rule, you can do almost anything. And I think in creatively, we look for those rules. You know, what's the rule we can't break with this number? What's the internal logic for our character? What's the internal, and, and if you are suffused in that, and if you add discipline, it makes it better. I mean, as a lyricist, that's what I believe. I could, as you can see, talk for hours and it, with <laughs> rambling things. But when I write lyrics, I am forced to be brief and to follow a structure. And that makes it so much better than having to listen to me right now. So. Uh, I think the show, uh, you're, you're talking about Dave was the musical that you're talking Dave about? Dave was the musical. So you remember the Kevin Klein movie Dave, uh, which is a lovely movie, and it's going to be a fantastic musical, again, written by her. But I remember uh, the day you came home and said, it looks like we won't need the six or seven child actors, because we're cutting the child actors, because we don't need the scene set in the school. And that was the happiest day in the producer's so, life. In my life as well, yeah. too, because I'm doing another show that involves children and dogs. Yeah. Um, and literally, it is, a, yeah. it is a producer's nightmare. And that makes it uh, an author's challenge. Yeah. Uh, because, as you said, there's three casts of kids. There's three, I, you know. It's, it's, it's an amazing realization that producers will start with you at the beginning of a journey. And you're talking about mostly morals, ethics, 
story, character, plot, the, the, the value to the world of your show. And then when you get to opening night, you're running a <coughs> restaurant. You have to put butts in seats. You have to make your nut every week. And, but both concerns are valid, and it's good to think about both of them all the way through the process. Well, that, that's sort of what I was getting at. It's a tremendously personal art form, and it's less ephemeral than it used to be, right? Because, Very true. as you say, Heather's hasn't gone to Broadway yet, but yeah. everybody... Had- the Internet has transformed things uh, immensely. Uh, and this is my other favorite thing, the most macro of all. Theater will survive when everything else dissolves. Think about the recording industry. It started out with expensive vinyl, and your, uh, per, your record label could say, sorry, I have to take 99% of your money to pay for plastic and pay for vinyl. The inefficiency was the excuse for money making, and then uh, cassettes and CDs, and now that's dissolving. iTunes and then Spotify, it's almost impossible to make money off of the inefficiencies of the delivery system for your song. But you show up in concert and you sell t-shirts and you, you sell your tickets and you make your money. Theater will survive when every other art form dissolves into unprofitability. Yeah. We have a question right here. sort of an august location, much like Harvard Law School. But actually, these days, we seem to have an incredible collaboration with regional theaters, and there are brilliant creative people all around the country, given our strong regional theater network. And a lot of that fosters the creation that you've been talking about. So I was curious about that. And then also this afterlife, this touring. I mean, when I was a kid, I'm class of 67, when I was a kid, the touring circuit was gone. And all these small towns, it was like, oh, they had shuttered theaters. And so many places, small towns, have revived their old movie theaters, formerly vaudeville theaters. Concord, New Hampshire, uh, small towns in Vermont, uh, Maine. And we see tours and we see a lot of this afterlife now. They can be at various levels of professionalism, some are equity, some not. And you've got your regional theaters doing these shows in their afterlife. So it seems to me it's much more of a spectrum almost. So I was wondering if some of what you're talking about, you would in talk about this larger picture and how it's relevant or playing or influencing what we, what you're what you've been talking about. I'll I'll, I'll <laughs> start off. I think it's all economics. Both your answers are economic. The first one is I'll take the last one, which is the, the circuit. What happened in America, as I see it anyway, was all of these towns, the big towns wanted sports arenas and they they threw bond deals up to raise zillions of dollars and tax the people to put up a, an arena so that you could get a major league franchise in some sport. But the artistic side of it was the art center, that all these towns decided that if they had an art center, they could become culturally refined, they could enhance their town, and it would be much less expensive, and they could do things all year round. And so what you see around the country is a plethora of big, you know, the whatever it may be, you pick the town, they got it. They have an art center that has a theater and a place for this and that, a black box. And then, and a lot of these are huge. They're 2,700 seat theaters, 2,500 seat theaters, and they need to fill them. And it's almost that the reciprocity between the big Broadway musicals, especially that tour, and there's a big touring circuit now they need this blood every year of these shows coming out that play in these arenas. Um, so that's part of it. I mean, that's, that's the second part of it. And the other part is also economic to me, the question of how we work with all these regional theaters, which are doing magnificent work. And part of it is that Broadway is so expensive, it's getting increasingly difficult to open out of town. You used to go... Mean Girls is going to Chicago. Yeah. Um, and uh, no, Mean Girls is, is it going Washington, to Washington. Washington, D.C. 
I have another one going to Chicago. But the, it's very hard. The producer has to, and the, the creatives have to make a judgment. How do we open this show? Do we go out of town? And so what's starting to happen now is that the regional theaters are becoming the home of pre-Broadway shows that are playing there as if, that is using the auspices or enhancement of the arena or the alliance or you name it across the country. They're beginning now to open there. Uh, Evan Hansen did that. It went to Washington without having to put up the money it would have had to do if it went to Chicago or Seattle or San Diego. And the Globe in San Diego was doing that. So that more and more, there's a coalescence. Plus the fact the regional theaters are doing fabulous, <laughs> fabulous work. And their plays are coming to New York. But they need because Broadway, they, though, because, because if they just stayed, like if Evan Hansen just stayed and never went to Broadway, it would run out of an audience because you don't have the trillions of tourists coming in to, to see the show. They make more money if they can move the show. Well, they, they also have the reputation of being a, a house that transfers to Broadway, which leads to more subscribers because they think, oh, well, Evan Hansen was here and then went to Broadway. I don't have to pay $300 Broadway tickets for the next one because it'll be here. You know, it'll be in my very own community. Second Stage in New York yeah. is advertising that it was the launching pad for Dear Evan Hansen, which, of course, it was not. But no, the, nothing is truthful news anymore. But in, but in fact, it happened. We used that. We, we, we played arena in Washington, and we couldn't open on Broadway in time. So we were able to hook up a deal with Second Stage to give us a place to hang out before we could open right away on Broadway. But now they're, but that's, that's part of it. They're taking the credit, and it helps them get subscribers. That's their big banner for next year, as we were... We were the show that launched Dear Evan Hansen. If you were a subscriber, you could have gotten a ticket through us. Uh, we're, we're, again, we're talking about ethos. Um, there are only 41 theaters in the entire world that are allowed to call themselves Broadway theaters. It used to be 40, and then, now they just added the Hudson, so, uh, if I'm right. So in other words, there's a big difference in how much money your show can generate or how much you know, bragging rights you can claim. If you've had a show on Broadway, you're a Broadway producer, you're a Broadway composer, and if you haven't, you can't say that. Uh, in London, there's 80 theaters that can be called West End, and it's much less expensive to uh, produce there. And there's 80 theaters, which means more adventurous works can get a theater sooner. So there's this perception that Broadway is major leagues and anything else short of it is not. Eh, who knows? But the internet, again, is providing amazing opportunities. There's a show called Be More Chill, which was written by Joe Iconis, who I think has never had a show on Broadway yet, but he's a beloved guy who's got an internet following. He's a songwriter and a dude who does concerts of his own. And the show is now, again, it's number nine on the iTunes uh, charts, a show that made it to off-Broadway, had a short run, and uh, maybe it hasn't even been off Broadway. It had a regional run, I know, in New Jersey. But because the album is beloved and because the guy is beloved, the internet now provides, uh, it, it, it bypasses inefficiency. It provides a greater efficiency of delivering the product. So uh, Broadway will always be with us and it will always be a badge, but it's really wonderful to see shows that are able to get legs and get a, a valid, uh, a long tail. I think there's, it, it's sort of fair to say there's, there's a couple tiers, right? There's Broadway, there's the tours that come out of Broadway, both equity and non-equity. There's regional productions, some of which are being developed for Broadway. And then there's this other level of just the licensed productions that your school or your community theater are doing as well, which for authors is hugely important because that may be the only point you see any money for your show. Uh, there, a friend of mine who's a composer did a show and he, his tale is that it ran on Broadway for a short period of time and he ended up making less money off the show he wrote for seven years than the trumpet player made for playing it for something like 12 months. So, so what he looked forward to was the sub rights, was the, was the licensing, was the fact that people would be doing this show, he would get a little money from that, but more importantly, the show would be out there and people would be able to come back and say, we love it. And you know, maybe from then it would happen again somewhere. So you, know, you don't want to forget the fact that after Broadway and after all this sort of stuff, there are people all over the world who want to do theater and who might be inspired by your show. And that, that you know, is both financially but also uh, you know, soulfully a great advantage when you write these things. Going off of some of Larry said that maybe throwing a professor's in Bali, but um, 
via Lincoln Center, I worked with falsettos, and a huge part of what we did was quash bootlegged copies. Um, because of the fact that we were releasing in theaters and then releasing in PBS, and we were like a large part of the work that you did for Fall Sounds every morning was kind of from nine to ten. You like looked online for people selling bootlegs or that had uploaded bootlegs, and then getting huge fights with Reddit, making um, sure that they could get it out. And from what you said about Heather's, and from what I know of Heather's, um, it's been the opposite dynamic. That the bootlegs have made the show something that then gets, the album gets sold online and created this cult following such that you might end up in Broadway. Blonde yeah, too, yeah. as you said, you know, with Blonde too, we had, we did the MTV production and there were things all over right, the, the online. Right, with the whole Right, production. exactly. And, and, and everybody was saying, well, this is, this is going to pull people out of our theater seats. And we didn't find that at all. We found that it actually, MTV and that silly reality show and this stuff like that brought people who discovered it when they were not New York based or could not come to New York to see it uh, and, and gave us a little, you know, a tiny boost. We, we made the decision when bootleg started cropping up while Heather's was still running off Broadway that we were not going to take extraordinary efforts. We were doing so much already with our small mom and pop shop to keep the show going anyway. We said we don't actually have enough manpower or man hours to quash bootlegs of this show. And sure enough, it actually magnified our visibility for an off-Broadway show. Now, if Heathers does great in London and then somehow maybe comes to Broadway, we might have a different attitude about it because we don't necessarily want the canonical version starring Hugh Jackman to, um, to get bootleg too much. But we are, we, the world is the way it is, and we, we don't mind it. But funny thing is, just this morning, Kevin and I decided to demand that a particular YouTube production pull their production down. It's some regional, and they don't have the right to broadcast a bootleg of their regional production. And not because we're, in theory, uh, opposed to it, but just because this production was really abject and, and crappy. <laughs> like they, 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 we've seen wonderful regional productions of it. We've seen wonderful school productions of it. This one just was not like worth seeing. So it's rather arbitrary, but you know, this is the world we're in. Well, and so then, from a both a finance perspective, because like I said, I think part of our motivation was because it was doing its theater run, and right. once it stops being shown in movie theaters, then I think. The, the urgency of saying, you know, this is, this is diverting people away um, from seeing it on a different screen, maybe a larger one, but right. a different screen, um, would be diminished. But I'm interested in um, your reaction, just from an IP point of view, of saying, we own the rights, there are a lot of people who, like, especially for a show like Falsettos, I mean, you don't have that many actors on stage, but there's so much that goes into the hair and the makeup and the minding of the kid and all of that, that you had to at least feel like you were doing a service to in some ways. And in, in your case, and especially with Heather's, it seems like the at least good of the bootlegs are doing a service to your show, but from a kind of IP and collaboration standpoint, I don't know if there's a different kind of Well, the, like there's that. a lot of cost-benefit analysis that goes on. There's no doubt anybody who takes any one of their shows and puts it out there is infringing their copyrights and probably their trademarks in the in the name of the show. But the question is, do you enforce it? From a trademark point of view, if you don't enforce it, you could whittle away and lose your trademark rights. So that's important. But from a copyright point of view, you're allowed to make choices as to what you choose to go after. And there are many people, when shows are starting, you want to build, and you, know, you kind of let the fans do that. There are people like, what am I famous clients, J.K. Rowling, who likes the internet to go and do things. You know, that's a fun thing. Let people go and do things. You start selling, though, a competitive product to the official products, that becomes a different analysis. And that's what you probably saw with the recent Star Trek enforcement action against a fan film, which was crowdsourced to uh, they raised a million dollars. They got a, lot, a professional crew to come in. People who had worked on Star Trek were going to make this new fan mm -hmm. film, which was the story of Star Trek. And they said, when, are we, when is this fan film going to be different in how people look than the actual films that we spent $100 million on? I'm a pro that's a problem. We're going to stop it. So there's dynamic issues every day as you decide 
where are you choosing to draw the line for this particular property at this particular time? And they're hard questions. And sometimes they are not legally based, but as, but as you were saying, I didn't like it. Like back when I was in law school, you know, uh, there was uh, the first star, there, there was a lot of Star Wars fandom, right? And I was part of that. I tend to be a geek and fans of comics and science fiction and Star Trek, Star Wars. And we were all being annoyed because there wasn't, um, George Lucas seemed to be letting a lot of fan stories go out about a lot of stuff, but he seemed to be cracking down on those romantic stories between Luke and Leah getting together. Well, as time went on, you can see why he might have been annoyed about stories about Luke and Leah getting together. That would have been icky if you were the creator and had a point of view about it. But that's the thing. The creators under IP law get to make those decisions. And I think that that's a beautiful thing about IP law. I'm, I'm wondering, have you been dealing with the off-Broadway show called Puffs yet? Sorry, is that a? Is that well, a, let me a, let me just a, ask yeah. you guys: Have you seen it? I have not seen it. Okay. Do, I don't know if you know what it is. I believe it's off Broadway at New World Stages, the same theater complex where Heather's ran, and it's sort of like a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, only applied to the Harry Potter world. It's if I am correct, it's about the Hufflepuffs, and as they're watching most of the Harry Potter events from the sidelines, basically. And we'll say we we. We That's haven't seen it due to time, due to work and having a daughter. It is definitely, as a huge Harry Potter fan, something that I would have gone to see or will go to see at some point. So Unless you think we should. So, 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 <laughs> so, Unless you think J.K. So, Rowling so, would be mad. So let, let me, since I can't talk about anything, Le uh, this Leap Roy, you let's pretend that you're the lead producer for Cursed Child that's coming to Broadway next spring and. Rumor has it will sell a few tickets, and 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 let's say there's these this puffs that they're calling a parody, but as I teach in my class, calling it something doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Um, there were also other versions of Harry Potter parodies. There's I think other parodies of other things that are going to be opening about other shows. There's Spamilton, which David Zippel was, this, was involved in. David yeah. Zippel's one of the producers. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So what do you think about the, whether it's Spamilton, whether it's Puffs, whether, what do you think about those kinds of shows as a, as a producer? Well, each one is a separate case. It's like law school. Everything, <laughs> everything is differentiable. Everything is distinguishable. Uh, by the way, this J.K. Rowling, has that worked out for you? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, good, it's, cl good client. Right. Yeah. Um, if only I had a piece of the equity. But yeah. <laughs> she, and you will never get a piece of the equity from her. <laughs> that I can assure you. Um, uh, it's, it really is case to case. I do know in the Hamilton case, um, the Hamilton producers made a judgment at the start that this was a small... 72nd Street at the Triad Theater, which was not a theater, it's a bar or a restaurant, and that we would allow it. But now that it's becoming bigger, more important, my guess is that something will happen legally. And that's part of the, this equation we're talking about. When it's de minimis, when it really doesn't matter, when it's at the fringe, you can close your eyes to it. When it becomes really important and can distort what the product is, I think then you want to take some action. So I think that's... I mean, le the, the legal principle that comes up, and it came up in a Broadway show case that I wasn't involved with, but, but sadly, but it was a really cool case, involved um, Hand, Hand God, which was a very successful, Tony-nominated, funny drama about a young man who had a obsessed evil puppet evil puppet. puppet and whether it was a puppet or whether it was him being the you know you know who knows but there was this crazy puppet and they did the um uh the the who's on first routine in the midst of that show that they did a two minute routine him and the puppet doing that and the people who thought they owned the who's on first right sued saying hey this is a really funny comedic highlight in the middle of this show but you're infringing our rights. They said it's fair use under copyright law, and the district court agreed, and the Second Circuit said it was not fair use. Why wasn't it fair use? Because while the show was super creative and wonderful and great, there wasn't anything that was commenting on or 
transforming using the routine. They just did the routine. They weren't doing the routine in a way that was different from anybody else who would be doing the routine. And the court said because they were just using the routine, using the entertainment aspect of it, it wasn't the same thing. Like somebody taking a number from Legally Blonde and just inserting it into something which, else. Which has happened. Has happened. There, yeah. is, there is a, what was it, a Japanese theater company? Oh, no, a Korean, Korean theater company <laughs> who wrote a whole new show called, I believe, Legally Blind, which was a mashup. It was a Helen of, Keller musical. It was a Helen Keller musical. <laughs> what? Using all of our songs. Using songs from Legally Blonde and Bat Boy with brand new lyrics to tell the story of Helen Keller. <laughs> um, She's obviously an O'Keefe Benjamin fan. <laughs> so, so, yeah, no, so, yes, and, and, you know, our lawyer was speaking to us saying, well, they're basically just using your stuff. They're not parodying, they're not yeah. commenting on it your stuff. It is unfairest use he's ever seen. Right. He's like, <laughs> but we have absolutely no hope of shutting this down anyway. You'll because, never get a Because it was in Japan. Yes. And apparently they're, uh, like, not just a theater, but also a religious cult. So it was a very exciting time for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, as, as an author, so you know, you're delighted if you have something so big and in the, that people want to parody it. The, I think that's yeah. probably the point where authors mm-hmm. stray from producers and say, Spamilton sounds great to me. <laughs> I'm going to uh, tell the audience the true story. You're not telling them the uh-huh. truth. And the truth is that because this was a Korean production, um, they threatened, and that's why we have the problems we're having with Korea, because of that, that's... I didn't want it known, but it was going to be leaked anyway. It all well, you know, began the, with these the, two people. You know, the demilitarized zone repertory theater is really not a very popular <laughs> place. Tensions were rising, and we just, we were the flame. We lit the fuse. Yes, please. I asked a question on Hamilton. Uh, I mean, it is the most 180-degree thing. If I were reproached to contribute some money towards this thing, I would have laughed at it. Where, where did they get the money to do this? Uh, you know, did Ron Chernow know a few people? I don't know. Ron didn't know them. The, the money for Hamilton was raised on the back of Lynn manuels brilliance. That's really what it was, that the people who were involved in, in the Heights, who had done well, won a Tony, um, were approached and the money was funded. It's not an expensive show. It's a single set, n- no real moving parts other than the stage, uh, the, the stage itself, but it's, it's, it was not expensive. And again, there was that belief in him. Sondheim raised money that way too. On the back of Sondheim, you could raise, you could raise money. But I'll tell you some, uh, a couple, two moments on that. The Evan Hansen we talked about before, autism and suicide as a musical, um, and try to raise money for that. Um, well, I was the lead producer of Color Purple. I remember going out to people saying, this is gonna be a great show, which it turned out to be, but who could believe? And it was, you know, she's raped twice when she's 12 years old and 14 years old, and it's misery in the, in the South, and, and who's gonna do it? And I remember responding to people saying, if you don't wanna do Color Purple, I have a show for you. It takes place in Russia. And it involves a group that's totally subjugated by the czar. And the first act ends in a pogrom. And the second act ends in having to leave their town. So the eviction uh, from Anatevka is the end of the show. And the first act ends in a pogrom. And it's a musical. And it's a musical comedy. You want to invest in that one. When that returned 2,700 times, Fiddler. But the point is, you don't know. You just don't know. Hamilton breaks every rule. It just breaks every rule. Everything about it is wrong, um, and yet it's a work of genius. And that's why I said earlier when you were talking about, without denigrating, but the idea of morals, principles, that's genius. Genius in anything works. Genius in law, genius in creativity. That's the answer. Lin-Manuel could write the next show about the phone book as you said, uh, that anything. I'd go. I would go to. I, I will temper that with saying there is one rule it doesn't break, which is the heart, the belief of Lin-Manuel. His genius, yes, is clear. You can't, you can't bottle it. But he believed in that show, and other people believed in his belief. Uh, Lin-Manuel has, done show, has been involved in a show that didn't run as long. Like, Bring It On didn't become Hamilton, even though he was involved. Uh, which is not to say he didn't believe in what he was doing, but Hamilton was like, 
was his baby. And, and, and I want to make that point because you always feel as a creative artist, if it's, your, if it's your baby and you have belief in it and someone shares that with you, I feel like that is a great indicator. And because no artist is going to be like, well, actually, an, an artist might call themselves a genius, but that's probably not the person you want to work with. But, a, but, a, <laughs> but rather than saying, I'm a genius, you must do my show, say, I believe in it and what it has to say, that to me is... That's the rule that you I, I, I have to say, I, I think my point is still being proven for me. Um, <laughs> I'm not denigrating. Oh, absolutely. No, no. But because uh, Lynn Manuel's genius is not just in his execution or his, his, his grasp or his chops in writing things or uh, his ability to come up with a great funny line or a lyric or a melody. It's also in grasping the uses of theater and the reason why we all get into a room. I think that a show like Hamilton says brilliantly, are we okay? Well, if we fix this or if we fix that and he's daring and he pushes buttons and he's also very forgiving at the same time he believes in the promise of America he believes in the potential of immigrants to make America better and in the ability of immigrants and you know Americans born here to reconcile and get along it spoke to our time in a wonderful way that it, it involves healing and um, I don't know where I was going with this but um, he, he's got his finger on a pulse, and therefore everything, yeah, there were many things in the, sh many things about the show were wrong uh, about some of the ways shows are ordinarily done, or some of the sounds you ordinarily hear on Broadway, but he had some wonderful things to say that had not been thought of before. And more deeply personal. Too. Yeah, absolutely. But, it's, but it is hard. I mean, I get asked all the time to invest in, in, in things, and I, it's great. I mean, I love to be invited to do it. It's an exciting thing to get to do, but then you can't do everything. Or, and so what is it? Sometimes it's because this is a really great person, and I think they're wonderful and talented, and I, I'd like to be involved. Sometimes it's a more commercial, be oh, that's a really classic, great show with that person in it. That sounds like something that could make money. And sometimes it's, boy, this person, this is a needy show. You know, I can help the arts. I can actually help foster the arts by giving a little bit of money to, to something. And so you think of all those things. And sometimes you're right. And sometimes you're totally wrong. Like I, I was a, you know, tiny, I'm not, I'm not talking about Roy, but I was a teeny investor in a show called Bright Star last season that Steve Martin did. It was a bluegrass musical. And I love Steve Martin. I've liked some of his other plays, Picasso. And, and I thought it would be great. And I liked the show. But there's a part at the end of Act One where the adorable sweet couple you fall in love with some the evil i hope this is not a terrible spoiler throws the baby off the train and 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 it all ends well by the way <laughs> but but nonetheless for those who stayed for the second act yes, that's, exactly. that's the it point right. that's the point you know there you are like you know i thank god and it, it doesn't just my... throw like slow motion watch the suitcase <laughs> Like throw. It was like we're emphasizing this baby being killed, you know, and and for some reason it wasn't a crowd crowd pleaser. And there I am, just sitting kind of in the audience, hoping. And it's like, oh, everybody says, "What a terrible!" I, and just like you said, they left. Yeah. And and so, but yet Steve felt, Mr. Martin to me, but anyway, Steve felt <laughs> that he was achieving his artistic vision. They were happy with the show. That was their artistic choice. It ended up having a not so good commercial impact, you know, from it. So what I'm saying is you make all these decisions and sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong and maybe you're right every time. It's just other people are voting too and that's the audience. Uh, I'm very moved by all of your um little engine that could underpinnings. <laughs> could you, uh, asking a question that takes advantage of having all of you together, um, could you talk about your own equanimity during the seven years? Um, uh, <laughs> your own, um, you know, uh, uh, is there, Larry, is there a, a, a Heather's character you'd like to explode <laughs> at some point? You know, I'd be curious uh, how you write it out. Well, uh, the great Craig Carnelia, who's a wonderful Broadway uh, composer and lyricist, gave us great advice once. He said, if we knew 
how fucking long it would take us to get a show from initial idea and enthusiasm to opening night, we would never start. But the time's going to pass anyway. <laughs> so do it. If that's what you love to do, do it. Now, a lot of us were working on three, four, five, six, seven projects at once because you'll get a little money up front for this show and this show and this show, and you can't, you cannot do a career on one show at a time linearly. You have to work on not as a writer at any rate, not as a writer, or maybe even as a producer. But I know as a writer. But also, we get into this because of people like Roy. We get into this because of people. You know, investors and angels and people because we want to be in a room with them, we want to have drinks with them, we want to get pizza with them, we want to learn from them and hear about theater, we want to learn how to be better people, we want to learn about the history of theater, we want to steal uh, ideas from <laughs> disciplines we know nothing about. I still don't call myself a producer even though I had the credit of, as a producer of Heather's. I will never be a good producer that you're looking at a brilliant producer. So we do this not just to finish the show but because this is the life we love, if that makes sense. Um. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I'm working on seven different projects right now. Actually, a big, a, a, a big issue for me was when you're a writer and someone will pay you to write something and you're starting out, you take that job because there's not a lot of people who will pay you to write stuff. So I took everything, everything, writing, and, and that is still what I tell people to do. It's like, to just take the job and find... But now I find myself in a, in, in a somewhat luxurious position of saying, okay, it, is there something in this idea which may not be mine that speaks to me, that I want to say? Because if there isn't, then that's seven, eight years, uh, you know, minding someone else's baby. So, uh, but, I, but I do find that I tend to be offered by people that I like and respect ideas that do have an exciting bent to them. And if you can get excited about your project, that's how you get through seven years. But you do, there is a lot of, I think the hardest part now is scheduling so we're all in the room together because every project that I'm on, everybody else is doing seven other projects <laughs> and we can't even get a meeting with all the writers and the director in one room at the same time. And, and that adds months to the project, which I'm sure is infuriating for producers. Oh, for but. corporate people in this room, that's, oh, the, way the, that's the, the way, that's the, way the world works. You can't get corporate <laughs> meetings uh, corporate meetings take seven different people working to book to get a meeting. It's the same thing, All right. but it's not seven years. All right. But you might be on salary, which we are not. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be our last question, please. Um, for those of you all who came from the law school, um, Dale obviously, your legal training, you're applying every day in the right And you mentioned that you can look for any of the numbers many lawyers don't understand at all. But has, has your legal training here helped you all in your all's Broadway careers? Well, Dale, it's obvious, and these are not law school graduates, even no. though they pretend to be. They, we went they, to the college. They went to the college. And Harvard Law School keeps thinking we went here, and they invite us. <laughs> and we, say, we always say, please, you know we didn't. And they're like, that's okay. And then we wind that's up with our... Steve with, yeah. yeah, Nell Benjamin 93. And so <laughs> we're in the literature. They're, they're looking to you. They're pro, for, they're pro forma. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we, but I, wrote, we wrote a show about Harvard Law School. It took us four and a half years. You can get a Harvard Law degree in that time. <laughs> yeah. And she did. I, I, would, I would answer you this way as, as the one yeah. middle person. I have found my Harvard degree invaluable from the day I graduated through today. It has never stopped being meaningful, the education and the degree, both. Um, what I learned here was how to approach problems and how to anticipate problems. And life is a problem. And theater is a problem. Everything's a problem. This is true. Everything, everything in life, there are pitfalls that you don't see until too late. Um, anticipating problems, figuring out how to get out of problems, problem solving. But the, the degree of thought um, and the fact that so much of our business is contractual. Everything is contractual. And everything is fraught with danger in terms of whether it's IP problems or whatever. So having an awareness of it, not having the expertise, I have a, a team of lawyers who work on the shows I do, um, but I can at least converse with them, and I understand what the problems are early enough. So it's been great, and in terms of the, of, of the importance of the degree and the, and, the, and the cred that comes to you, I thought it would be five years, three years when I got started. It's all of my life. It never stops being of value. I'm one of the greatest 
proponents of this education. I, within, within, within Jeffrey's, my firm in Wall Street, I've always told younger people, get a law degree, not a business degree. It serves you much better. It's also a trade. It's a profession. Uh, uh, but I am a huge proponent of the school. And problem solving, probably more important in theater than, than <laughs> any other industry, because people do not go into theater because they dislike drama. If you can get... <laughs> I mean, I, I, my, if you can get 20% of the drama surrounding your show onto the stage, you are, you are doing very well, sir. You know, and so I think it, when you meet somebody who's actually like, we can solve this problem, you want to work with them for the rest of your natural life. Our very limited experience with law, I've, I took a law course or two in graduate school and have had, we, we know just enough about law to get ourselves in deep trouble, but w we have obviously absorbed some of the issues like rhetoric and, and contractual issues, but what we realize is that the whole point of law, that, as we understand it, is to encourage good behavior and, and good faith practices and to discourage bad behavior and bad faith practices. And so we, you can tell we're optimists, otherwise we wouldn't work in theater. But <laughs> we have, in our, in our limited experience with law and Harvard Law School, we've discovered just how, uh, what, what a great way it is to see the world through these eyes. And uh, some of our favorite people, like, like Stephen Price and uh, L.A. Thompson, um, just great people. Um, who have helped us in our shows and have have uh, given us wisdom, and it seems to fuel our our stuff. And uh, I guess we'd say, let everyone know you went to Harvard Law School. You'll get <laughs> better friends. <laughs> <laughs> you make good friends. Yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> what a great panel! Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>